Well, welcome everybody to the second edition of Ask a Property Manager. Andrew Schultz is here with us of Realty Edge, and uh, he's nice enough to join us again this week. Uh, real quick, Andrew, uh, if you want to just tell us about what you do and where you're from. Sure. Uh, I'm a property manager with Realty Edge. I'm actually an associate broker over there. Uh, I've been with Realty Edge for several years now. We have a property management operation that spans um, Erie, Niagara counties, the city of Buffalo, city of Niagara Falls, city of Lockport, areas like that. Okay. And uh, we got four questions that we uh, found in the uh, Facebook group, Rent Prep for Landlords. And I'm going to ask you those and just kind of get your uh, thoughts on those questions. So Great. without further ado, the first question comes from Rebecca. And she said that she's a longtime landlord, first time posting. And she was curious, where do you advertise your vacant rentals? It looks like she does Craigslist, Realtor.com and Doorsteps.com. Wondering mm -hmm. for you and your 120 rentals that you manage, uh, where do you tend to post? Um, we use Zillow has a, a package called Rental Manager, which when you put it in on Rental Manager, it pushes it to Zillow, Trulia, and Hot Pads. I would say probably about 90% of our leads come from those three websites. Um, we were using Craigslist for a long time, but we were having a lot of issues with scammers taking our photos and relisting the apartment for less than what we had it listed for. Mm -hmm. So we stopped using Craigslist. Um, I'm actually thinking about going back to Craigslist. A lot of people seem to be having some success there, so I'm thinking I might try it again just to see how it goes. And then we obviously put signs in most of our properties' lawns, so that's uh, that accounts for probably the other 10% of leads. Yeah, yeah, and I've also heard from different property managers where Craigslist can be a great resource in one part of the country and be a terrible resource in another. I guess it kind of right. depends on what kind of uh, applicant you start drawing from it. But uh, right, exactly. All right. Uh, the next question we got here comes from Stephanie, and she said, "When you were receiving emails about a rental." What does your first response consist of? Do you ask questions? If so, which questions? Do you just schedule a showing? Sure. So generally what I'll do is when I get a lead, uh, either through Zillow, Trulia, Hotpads, whatever website it comes in through, they come into my email box. Usually I have a name, a phone number, an email address, and sometimes I get a little bit of information depending on how much of the forms they filled out. Uh, I'll call first. If I don't get a hold of them, I'll leave a voicemail. Um, then I'll, I'll respond with an email. We have a general template email that we use for all of our apartments uh, that we kind of customize to whatever the apartment is that we're leasing that contains the information about the rent and what our qualifications are and things like that. So if I get a hold of somebody on the phone, mm -hmm. what I'll typically do is talk to them a little bit about the apartment. Um, I'll explain to them what our qualifications are, an income of three times the rent, a net income of three times the rent, so after taxes, uh, a credit score of 620, and then most of our clients do give us the authorization if somebody's under a 620, we either do like a first last security or a double security deposit. And that's kind of a state dependent thing. So you got to check your state laws on that to see what they what they allow for. Um, after that, I move into kind of the more in-depth questions. Once they once they verify, yes, I have that amount of income. Yes, I have or don't have that credit score, uh, you know, whichever way it happens to go. Um, I just ask a few basic questions. I ask when they're looking to move so mm -hmm. that I can put that, you know, kind of target as to where we're going to be if this person ends up renting the apartment. I ask them how many people are going to be living in the apartment, not how many adults, not how many children, because that can turn into a fair housing issue very quickly. Okay. I ask how many people. Um, generally, they'll actually offer up the information as to how many adults and how many children. But you just can't ask the question, how many adults, how many children. Uh, and if they tell me it's just it's going to be three people, I don't inquire any further than that. Okay. Uh, just because it's it, there's a fine line there. We're going to get that information when they put in their applications anyway. And then um, let's see what else do we ask? We ask them if they're going to have any pets. Um, if they say they have an emotional support animal, at this point we're just saying okay. Mm -hmm. um, we we deal with that issue when we come to it. Yep. And then the only other question that I ask is when do they want to see it? And then we get them scheduled and we go from there. Okay. Uh, one thing that I noticed is you said that your um, rent to income ratio is actually based on the net income after taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard a lot of people say that they go based on gross. Is there any particular reason that you go with that way? Or it, I like net because I feel net's a better a better uh, indicator of like being for? able to pay rent. Yeah, a better indicator. It of makes their sense. I mean, pay. hypothetically. I mean, if somebody yeah, had 100% a hundred percent taxes. 50, <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you have a $50,000 a year job, say, but the, 
biggest majority of your income is going to, say, a child support or something like that, mm -hmm. that's not income you're going to see. So really, the net income is what I want to know. What do you have left in your pocket after you pay for your taxes, your health insurance, your any other deductions, your retirement? What do you have in your pocket? Because that's the money that's available to you to pay your bills on a monthly basis. So that's why I always look at the net income. And you said you do a 3x multiplier on that number? We do. Yeah, we look for a three times the rent multiplier. Okay. Yeah, that, that's helpful to know. So next question, this comes from Kyle. He said, uh, did you ever call inherited tenants before taking over the property to let them know you will be the new manager? If so, what else did you say to them? I don't. I don't contact tenants before I own the property. I think it's not really a great idea to do so. Um, being a licensed real estate agent, I do kind of have a little bit of a competitive advantage. When I walk through a property, if the tenants are home, I'll ask them some basic questions. Do you have any maintenance issues that haven't been addressed and stuff like that? That kind of gives me a feel for, am I walking into a property that's going to have a bunch of deferred maintenance that I'm not seeing? Okay. Uh, is this property owner taking care of the property? Or is this tenant an issue that needs to be addressed once we take possession of the property? But as far as contacting the tenants outside of viewing the property, I don't. Okay. Uh, usually what I do is after we close, I have a welcome letter that we send to all the tenants explaining this is who we are, this is what we do, you know, um, your lease is still in full effect, your lease transferred with the with the sale of the property, things like that. And then I have them call us or I try to meet them in person and we try to just get the basic information from them, name, phone number, uh, do you have any maintenance concerns, who all's living in the apartment, do you have any pets, things along those lines. So I usually don't do anything until after we've already taken possession of the property past that that initial showing period like if i'm there and can get some answers then perfect uh, but if not i don't make an attempt i don't think it's i don't think you can even do that in new york state to be honest with you so okay we just don't yeah i thought that was a really interesting point as far as the fact that you can ask them those questions if you see them in person on the maintenance because obviously somebody selling isn't always going to show you everything wrong with the place but right exactly but the current tenant that's lived there for two years certainly is going to know a lot of the things that are wrong with it so Right, exactly. Yeah, I like that a lot. So our last question here, this comes from Rose. She says, how late does rent need to be before I send a pay or quit notice? Depends on what your lease says. The way our leases are written, rent's due on the 1st, and it's late after the 5th with a late fee. Uh, and then we have a, it's a $50 late fee, and then we have a $2 a day fee uh, for every day that it's late past that. Okay. Uh, on the 5th, I'm making my late rent calls. And once the mail arrives, so I know if I received any checks, I'm making my late rent calls on the 5th. We call, we text, we email. We hit them as many times as we can with whatever information we have. And if there's multiple tenants, I'm going to call, text, and email every tenant until I get an answer. If I don't hear anything on the 5th, the morning of the 6th, I'm drafting my three-day pay or quit notices, and I'm out serving those notices in the afternoon of the 6th. I don't delay. All you're doing by delaying is causing yourself more headaches. Mm. You're just giving that tenant more time to come up with excuses or whatever. There's yeah. no reason to wait when it comes to issuing a three-day notice. The other thing I do is if a tenant comes to us and has a, you know, they need to split their rent. They have to pay half now, half later in the month or whatever. That's fine. We usually don't have a problem with that as long as they pay their late fee, mm. uh, unless they're like a habitually late tenant. But I advise them, you're going to get served a three-day notice. Understand the fact that I'm going to give you until the date that we talked about to get your payment in to me. Hmm. But if you don't have your payment in by that date, the next day I'm filing the eviction. Yep. So we're, we have a very strict rent collection procedure. Sure. And it's, it's only benefited us and our clients. We usually see about 95% rent collection on a monthly basis by the 10th of the month when we do our monthly reporting. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I think a lot of it too is uh, the landlords that kind of fall traps to that and the property managers that fall into that trap are usually too nice and they're worried about, you know, being the bad guy. And to me, it's kind of like Pavlov's dog where right. if you set these structures up in place, they're going to start paying on time because they know right. that this repercussion is coming down the pipe. So it's Absolutely. just being consistent and being firm, but fair, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is there's so many ways for tenants to pay rent now. We're set up so that tenants can pay their rent online, and mm -hmm. I see it as soon as they make the payment, so I know that a payment was made. They can mail us a check. They can mail us a money order, which is our least preferred way of doing it. But we're even set up with that. Uh, I think it's called Pay Near Me is the name of the company. Okay. You can walk into, like, any 7-Eleven 
and pay your rent at any 7-Eleven, and they pay a, like a three ninety nine fee or something like that. It's just like them going to a store and paying their utility bill. Mm-hmm. But you can, you know, it's very straightforward. It's very easy to use. The tenants can walk into any 7-Eleven nationwide, and there's 7-Elevens everywhere. So if you're if you're away on vacation, there's no excuse to not have your rent mailed to us. Yeah. Or log on and pay it online or whatever. So there's there's no excuse for late rent. There really isn't. Hey, I appreciate you being on the uh, the episode this week here, and it's just nice kind of getting a deep dive of the uh, answers on these uh, great questions we're getting inside of the Facebook group. So if anybody has any questions, they can feel free to also tag Andrew in that question. I'm sure you wouldn't mind. Um, you're in the group there, Andrew Schultz. You can tag me as well. I yep. uh, would love to 